Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our March OP deck. We're glad you're able to join us. My name is Amanda Isaac, and I'm a pharmacist with the North Carolina Division of Public Health, and we'll be helping facilitate this meeting. It's been almost two years since we've been holding these meetings in a virtual environment, so I first just wanted to recognize and thank the Governor's Institute for all of their support behind the scenes in helping us host these meetings in this space. We have a really exciting lineup of speakers today that will be focusing on updates and trends in the treatment of opioid use disorder. And there's a lot to cover, so I wanna make sure to maximize our time. But before I turn it over, we always like knowing where people are tuning in from and getting to know a little bit about you. So feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. And as we have in the past, we will also pull up a poll for you to um, indicate what discipline or field you're coming to this work from. So you see that pulled up and we'll give folks a minute. I know people probably fit into multiple of these categories, so please pick the one that best represents your work. And if none of them do, feel free to select other and let us know in the chat where you're coming from. So we'll give everyone a minute to do that. Great, well, as usual, it looks like we have a really diverse group with lots of experience and expertise in the room, which is great. So before we get started, I also wanted to acknowledge that today's meeting is being held in a webinar format rather than a meeting format. So what that means is as a participant, you won't see an option to unmute at the bottom of your screen. And we do that just to limit background noise with so many people on the line. However, you should see a function for question and answer. So my colleagues with the State Opioid Treatment Authority who played an integral part in helping us plan this meeting will be monitoring that box. And there'll be time at the end of each presenter's block for those questions to be addressed. So feel free to drop questions in the Q&A chat as they come to mind. This meeting is being recorded and the recording along with the slides will be available within seven days of the meeting. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Kandra Wooten, who will be giving us an overview of what evidence-based treatment for opioid use disorder looks like. Dr. Wooten is a board certified family physician with a passion for addiction medicine and is coming to us from Eleanor Health. We also have with us Dr. Michael Baca Atlas, who's a clinical assistant professor with the Department of Family Medicine at UNC, and will be helping facilitate discussion towards the end of the block. So it's great to have you both. And Dr. Wooten, I'll pass it to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to North Carolina Opioid and Prescription Drug Abuse Advisory Committee. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Michael Baca Atlas, for inviting me to speak today. So, um, what is MOUD? Is it treatment that works? And, and what does work? What doesn't work in helping those with opioid use disorder? Uh, objectives today would include reviewing opioid, opiate use in the United States, discuss utilizing a chronic illness framework for opioid use disorder and substance use disorder in general, understand what settings patients can access MOUD, review medications for treatment of opioid use disorder, and discuss strategies to engage patients around treatment discussions. So I have no actual or potential conflicts of interest in relation to this program and no disclosures. All right, a little trivia to start. Um, so we'll be talking about different types of MOUD um, or medications for opioid use disorder today. How many are available? Typically we think of three major uh, medications that would be methadone, buprenorphine, and now Trexone, but there actually is technically four, uh, lev acetylmethadol, similar to methadol, methadone, um, LAAM was approved in 1993 by the United States Food and Drug Administration for use in the treatment of opioid dependence. But in 2001, LAAM was removed from the European market due to reports of life-threatening ventricular rhythm disorders. In 2003, uh, Roxanne Laboratories Incorporated discontinued LAAM. 
So a uh, little bit of trivia to start. So I love this photo of the opium poppy. This plant is such a beautiful plant, Popover somniferum. Uh, opium, morphine, codeine, and heroin are all derived from the milky latex of this species of plant found in its unripe seed capsule. These chemicals that I just named are chemicals that interact with opioid receptors in the body and the brain. They reduce the intensity of pain signals and they also produce euphoria in addition to pain relief. And because of this, they can be misused and have addiction potential. So, so much beauty can cause so much disaster. Um, these two words are often interchanged, um, but I wanted to just comment that the term opioids is the general term. Uh, a natural opioid is an opiate. So opium, morphine, and codeine, and thebane are all considered natural opioids. Uh, Semi-synthetic opioids include heroin, oxycodone, hydrocodone, and buprenorphine. And purely synthetic opioids would be methadone, fentanyl, and tramadol. So the United States uh, is in the midst of a syndemic. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this term, but when there are more than one epidemics, in this case two, that are synergistically combined uh, and causing increased um, or exacerbated problems, each individually. You know, communities across our nation have been tragically affected by the opioid overdose epidemic, partly attributed to the rapid proliferation of illicitly made fentanyl and other highly potent synthetic opioids. And these highly potent opioids are mixed with heroin, sometimes sold alone as super potent heroin, pressed into counterfeit tablets to look like commonly misused prescription opioids or sedatives such as Xanax. And they're being mixed with other illicit drugs such as cocaine or methamphetamine. The resulting unpredictability in illegal drug products is dramatically increasing the risk of a fatal overdose. Reasons for increased drug overdose rates during the COVID-19 pandemic are multifaceted and may be in part due to reduced access to healthcare and recovery support services. So we're seeing a combination of the COVID-19 crisis and worsening uh, death from the use of uh, fentanyl in our communities. The COVID effect, the CDC's latest data show that 28 states had more than a 30% increase in overdose deaths in 2020 compared to 2019. 10 states increased by more than 40%. And as you can see in these headlines, particularly males, younger male, younger age groups, and even communities of color um, are having a higher proportion of death from overdose and COVID infection. So in general, people who have opioid use disorder are more likely to get COVID. In this next slide, uh, I wanted to show, I'm a visual person. So I wanted to show you, uh, this slide came from the Boston Globe, showing heroin, fentanyl, and even carfentanil in comparison to one another, the amount that would be a lethal dose. So compared to morphine, a lethal dose of morphine would be 1P. When you have talk about heroin, heroin about a sunflower seed size would be considered a lethal dose. And heroin is about two times the potency of morphine. When we talk about fentanyl, fentanyl is 100 times as potent as morphine. And it only takes something as small as one sesame seed to be lethal to the average person. Then we have carfentanil, which is 
10,000 times as potent as morphine. 0 0.1 um, or a half a grain of salt is enough to be a lethal dose. And you can see in the picture a dime to show you how small these amounts are. So someone can easily overdose on fentanyl if they're accustomed to heroin or other opioids. Even a very small dose of fentanyl weighing no more than a half of one grain of salt can potentially kill a person not accustomed. Opioid overdose. So symptoms of an overdose include respiratory depression or respiratory failure, slow, shallow breathing, unresponsiveness or coma, small or pinpoint pupils. Some people have seizures, sometimes even death. Um, symptoms can include blue skin from poor circulation and even confusion. But keep in mind, we often hear of overdose and we think, well, we just give that person Narcan or they end up getting CPR. But overdose is about getting a super therapeutic amount of opioid. The American Society of Addiction Medicine in 2019 defined addiction as a primary chronic and relapsing brain disease characterized by an individual pathologically pursuing reward or relief by substance use and other behaviors despite adverse consequences. So what is opioid use disorder? Opioid use disorder is a problematic pattern of opioid use that causes significant distress and impairment meeting at least two of 11 criteria, including unsuccessful efforts to cut down or to control their use, resulting in social problems, failure to fulfill obligations at their job, at home or at school due to opioid use, having cravings, exhibiting tolerance or even withdrawal from opioids, continued opioid use despite physical or psychological problems that are likely caused or exacerbated by the opioids. And it's important to keep in mind that substance use disorder in general should be treated like other chronic conditions. Substance use disorder, um, and specifically, for example, opioid use disorder, it can be caused by repeated exposure to a drug say for example, Percocet, coupled with genetic and environmental risk factors, leading to physical changes in the brain's opioid receptors. Addiction can be treated and managed with other medication, like other chronic medical conditions, such as asthma, we treat with albuterol. Someone may, have avoid, may avoid an asthma attack for years, but if they're exposed to pollen, they may have an asthma attack triggered and they may use more albuterol, maybe the, for the first time after two years. In this sense, we don't consider an asthmatic to no longer have asthma because they're not needing their uh, medication constantly, but it's there for them if they have a relapse of asthma. We need to look at substance use disorder in this same manner. These are, this is a chronic condition. And uh, I'll talk more about the purpose of thinking of it in a, as a chronic condition and then thinking of medications, their purpose in helping people remain healthy. So medication, medications for opioid use disorder. This is an approach to opioid use disorder treatment that combines the use of FDA approved medications with counseling and behavioral therapies for people diagnosed with opioid use disorder. So I wanna point out some things that um, when a person is using these medications, it can restore their emotional and decision-making capabilities. It can control, using these meds can control symptoms of opioid withdrawal and can suppress cravings. This promotes patient engagement in recovery-oriented activities. 
we combine this with behavioral interventions that can reduce stress reactivity and negative emotional states. This can improve self-regulation for the patients, increase avoidance uh, of relapse triggers, and overall enhance the salience of natural healthy rewards. Using these medications is effective for decreasing patient mortality and increasing access to these medications is very important. So in this slide, we're comparing more relapse rates with other chronic illnesses. As I mentioned, asthma, uh, we also look at hypertension. With a person taking their medications for hypertension, they still may have a 50 to 70% chance of relapse or their blood pressure not being at goal or controlled. With diabetes, with taking their meds, they still may have a 30 to 50% chance that their diabetes can become uncontrolled. And that would just mean that um, a relapse would mean that we need to resume treatment, modify treatment, or maybe even start new treatment. The same goes for substance use disorders. Relapse rates for people treated for substance use disorders are compared with those for people treated for high blood pressure and asthma. Relapse is common and similar across these illnesses. Therefore, substance use disorders should be treated like any other chronic illness. Medication efficacy for opioid use disorder. So what are the goals of MOUD? We have data that support these three, five important patient outcomes showing that these FDA approved medications, methadone, buprenorphine, oral naltrexone, and extended release naltrexone are all effective. Uh, the goals of MOUD include all cause decrease of mortality, decreasing death, decreasing death from overdose and other issues, decreasing morbidity, which means decreasing transmission of HIV, hepatitis C, and all other bloodborne viruses, decreasing infectious complications from IV drug use, also decreasing opioid use in general, increasing retention in addiction treatment, and improving health and well being overall. Lastly, decreasing drug related crime. I want to talk a little about what opioid withdrawal symptoms are. So, someone can experience nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, anxiety, insomnia, hot and cold flushes, sweats, muscle cramps, body aches tearing of their eyes, lacrimation, runny nose, goosebumps, and restlessness. I often hear patients, you know, they feel so miserable in um, th these moments and they feel like they're going to die. Um, and when we give them these medications, as well as uh, other supportive medications during, say, an induction or during these withdrawal periods, it gives them a break and a time to allow for um, promoting engagement in recovery-oriented activities. One of the ways we can determine how severe someone's withdrawal symptoms from opioid drugs are during medically-assisted detox, we use the CAL score, the Clinical Opiate Withdrawal Score. And this simply helps clinicians to manage the detox process safely. Uh, I worked for a while in an inpatient rehab, uh, and we would start to provide medications when their CAL score would reach approximately 13. For some people, before then, everyone's experience is a little different, but the goal is not to have them become totally miserable. 
So we would consider a score of five to 12 mild, 13 to 24 moderate, 25 to 36 moderately severe, and greater than 36 severe opioid withdrawal. So during this time, we would use supportive medications such as clonidine to help reduce anxiety and their blood pressure. We would use loperamide to help with diarrhea. We would use dicyclamine or bentol for abdominal cramping. We would use zofan or promethazine for nausea and vomiting, ibuprofen, Tylenol, or a muscle relaxer, Robaxin, for muscle pain, and trazodone or Seroquel, and maybe even melatonin for insomnia during the detox period and beyond, if indicated. So the evidence for how tapering off medications um, for detox does not work. Now, this is one of many trials that shown that medically assisted withdrawal, including tapering after a short period of stabilization with buprenorphine is unlikely to retain patients in treatment or prevent return to substance use. And as we mentioned, as I mentioned a moment ago, an asthma analogy, um, you can take away an asthma inhaler, but at some point they may need it again and need to return to that to control their asthma. So evidence is not showing that once a person is, has withdrawn and been tapered off of, say, th their heroin or Percocet, that they should then remain abstinent. There is a likely chance that they will return to use, relapse, and possibly even overdose. So what is not effective for treating opioid use disorder? Abstinence-based treatment or the complete cessation for the complete cessation of substance abuse. Abstinence for prolonged periods can often be harmful. There's a study done um, for a AJPH. Uh, it, it was a study that showed that 74 times as many higher risk of overdose came out of people who were incarcerated. And uh, it, rather compared to the general population. So, even though they had a, an extended period of time where they were not exposed to opioids, once they came out, they were 75 more times likely to reuse, relapse, or even overdose on opiates. So one way to increase access to these medications, to MOUD, is to eliminate barriers to treatment. To improve patient access to care for opioid use disorder, uh, in April of 2021, Health and Human Services Department simplified how providers could obtain an X waiver. So physicians, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, certified res registered nurse anesthetists, certified nurse midwives, all who are licensed under state law and who possess a valid DEA registration may be exempt from the certification requirements related to training, counseling, and other ancillary services. So they're no longer required to do the, the training, the counseling, the ancillary services, and they may treat up to 30 patients with buprenorphine their first year of seeing the first 12 months of them having an X waiver, and that can be increased. I wanted to spend a moment discussing harm reduction. So we talked a moment ago about abstinence and how that's not working. And of course it would be easy if people would just stop using, but this is not the situation that we're seeing. Evidence is showing that harm reduction is very helpful in decreasing rates of overdose. A positive approach to reduce the harm that may come from substance use. It includes individual and community-based safety practices aimed to improve overall health and wellness. This is driven by the promotion of acceptance instead of abstinence. Basic principles include the acceptance of substance use in communities around us in addition to the delivery of non-judgmental care. 
This values all people and their journey and minimizes harm through education without fear or shame, of shame. The belief that people using substances should be empowered to seek and receive quality healthcare, regardless of their use status and recognition of social differences that impact people's ability to change behaviors to reduce the risk of harm. Okay, so role of medications in the treatment of opioid use disorder. Detoxification, induction, early stabilization. So we reduce and stabilize withdrawal symptoms. And in, in this opportunity to initiate and engage in ongoing addiction treatment, as I mentioned, we're offering treatment for withdrawal is the humane and right thing to do, even if a person does not want to continue with treatment. Also with maintenance therapy, preventing or eliminating withdrawal symptoms diminishes or eliminates drug cravings and use of illicit opiates. Maintenance therapy blocks the effects of heroin and other abused opiates. And maintenance therapy re reduces risk, uh, harm reduction, reduces overdose risk. In this slide, most data is for methadone and buprenorphine, not as much for naltrexone, but Evidence that, again, I'm repeating this because it's so important to emphasize, increased treatment retention and engagement in comprehensive rehab, decreased medical and psychiatric symptoms, improves health, MOUD also reduces the risk of HIV and hepatitis C infection, and MOUD improved social determinants such as employment, family relations, decreased criminal behavior. We're gonna start talking specifically about some of these federally, um, these FDA approved medications. So methadone. Methadone has been around for a long time. In 1971, methadone began to be used uh, for opioid use disorder. It's a full opioid agonist. Some examples of methadone include brand names Dolophine and Methadose. And it's given as a daily liquid or tablet it attaches to the opioid receptors in the brain to block withdrawal symptoms and cravings. Methadone can only be prescribed in an opioid treatment program or an OTP and also can be dispensed in hospitals. Most common approach used worldwide, daily, directly observed therapy. And some people can earn take homes. Methadone is not reported in the PDMP. Uh, it's long acting with a half-life of about 15 to 60 hours. Approved to be dispensed in an OTP with strict federal regulation and in hospitals, uh, they're mandated to integrate, OTPs are mandated to integrate counseling into their treatment paradigm. The effective dose range is from 80 milligrams to 120 milligrams per day, typically, but some people need a higher dose. There's over 40 years of data supporting that it is safe. It leads to sustained opioid abstinence. Methadone reduces IV drug risk behavior, reduces transmission of hepatitis C and HIV. Methadone, though, can prolong the QTC interval. So it is recommended to do annual EKGs uh, and caution if a person has, of course, an allergy to methadone, if they have severe COPD or severe apnea because of the long half-life of methadone and its ability to suppress respiratory drive, um, it may not be the medication of choice for someone with those conditions. Buprenorphine is another uh, medication used for opioid use disorder. It's an opioid receptor 
partial agonist. I wanted to talk about buprenorphine um, in, in the different ways it is uh, given. So in this slide, I'm talking more about the combination of buprenorphine with naloxone, which first came about in 2002 to treat opioid use disorder. The rationale for using the combination of buprenorphine with naloxone was an attempt to decrease misuse or diversion. Naloxone, an opioid blocker, uh, is, an in, is inactive unless the medication is injected. So naloxone has a low bioavailability when used sublingually. Buprenorphine is typically prescribed once a day, up to 24 milligrams per day is the highest effective dose. There is a ceiling effect. And buprenorphine can be prescribed in an office by DOs, MDs, PAs, and PEs. You would caution uh, if, of course, an allergy to buprenorphine or severe liver disease. In this slide, I wanted to bring up some of the brand names, Suboxone for a combination of buprenorphine with naloxone, Zubzolve, Bunavail. Uh, these are daily transmucosal film or tablets that are used under the tongue, but their dosages are different. Um, so just play, pay close attention. If you are transitioning someone say from Suboxone eight milligram slash two milligram uh, film to Zubzolve 5.7 uh, milligram film. Be aware that the doses are different and don't match up equally. But in general, these are medications that attach to and partially activate the opioid receptors in the brain to ease withdrawal symptoms and cravings. And of course, less diversion risk than methadone. The buprenorphine monoproduct. So there is Subutex is a brand name. That's a daily tablet, typically given in uh, eight milligram tablets. And then there is Sublicade, uh, a monthly injection, a monoproduct. Where these medications um, that with, with Sublicade, it's usually started with a 300 milligram loading dose for two months and then decrease to a 100 milligram maintenance dose. But of note, even after 12 months of discontinuing sublocade, often it can be detected in plasma levels. I wanted to make note of a few other monoproducts of buprenorphine that are not indicated for opioid use disorder. Belbuca, Butrans, and Buprenex are formulations of buprenorphine, but are indicated for pain and not FDA indicated for opioid use disorder. Of course, we wanna caution use of buprenorphine for allergy or severe liver impairment. Okay, and now, now Trexone. Now Trexone is the third FDA approved medication for opioid use disorder. It is an opioid receptor antagonist or blocker. Now, Trexone comes in a tablet and also a monthly injection called Vivitrol. And these block the activity of opioid receptors in the brain to prevent euphoric effects, the high of opioids, and help reduce cravings. I wanted to mention a medication that we often get confused because they both are opioid receptor antagonists, and, and they are both very important. But this next medication is not uh, part of MOUD. Uh, naloxone is also known as Narcan, and that is the antidote for opioid overdose. So we have naloxone uh, is an opioid receptor antagonist, Brand names include Narcan, FZO, Claxado, Zimhi. And this is an emergency nasal spray or injection. This is the antidote 
to opioid overdose, but it is not a form of MOUD. There are normally, um, if we talked about the symptoms of an opioid overdose, where someone is in a coma, non-responsive, they might be blue, they may uh, have pinpoint pupils. And so if there's any thought that they could be experiencing an opioid overdose, or if you know that they are, then you want to first call 911. You want to, for example, the naloxone nasal spray, you wanna spray one ml in each nostril and repeat that every three minutes as needed if no response or if there's only minimal response until you get 911 gets there. I wanted to mention another medication that um, has been used, lofexidine. It's an adrenergic receptor agonist. Uh, it's also called Lusmira. And this attaches to and activates adrenergic receptors in the brain and helps alleviate withdrawal symptoms. This medication is very expected, expensive and uh, is not used often. This is a summary of medications for opioid use disorder. We have the mechanisms of action, again, to review. Methadone is a full agonist in opioid, on opioid receptors. Buprenorphine, oh, well, let me say, methadone is a full agonist. Dosing typically is 80 milligrams to 120 milligrams. Um, and advantages, it's provided in highly structured settings such as uh, OTPs, opioid treatment programs. Diversion is unlikely, but it may be effective for those who have not benefited from other MOUD. And it's also used in pregnancy. Buprenorphine is a partial agonist of the opioid receptor. Dosing is typically from four milligrams to as high as 32 milligrams per day. And the advantages, improved safety due to partial agonism, available in primary care settings, OTPs as well, available in several formulations, uh, subcutaneous injection, which I didn't talk about, implant and buccal. And also buprenorphine more and more is able to be used in pregnancy. And then we have naltrexone, which is given intramuscularly or PO. Uh, it is an opioid receptor blocker. Typically given is the injection in 380 milligram injection. The advantage is no additive potential or diversion risk, no withdrawal upon cessation. It is available in primary care settings and OTPs. Uh, and there's an option for individuals wanting to avoid opioids. So I get that question often, will I have to, will I experience withdrawal when I come off of naltrexone? And no, they will not. So a little ahead of schedule, thank you. I wanted to give some time for questions and uh, wanna return back to Amanda Isaac for the next speaker. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Wooten, for that overview of the medications to treat opioid use disorder and how effective they are. We've got um, just about 10 minutes for question and answer. So at this point, I'm gonna invite my colleagues at the SOTA team, um, Anna and Pam, to pull any questions that might've come through and we can have a discussion. So it looks like we've got one question so far. Could you please expand on the waiver and counseling requirements? I can't hear you, Dr. Wooten. Dr. Wooten, I think you're on mute, sorry. I do it all the time at work. What's, what's the specific question about the waiver? 
Yeah, just could you expand on the waiver and counseling requirement? So for methadone, there is a mandate to provide counseling, um, but with buprenorphine and naltrexone, it's recommended to have the ability for the, the patient to get counseling, but it is not mandated. And with uh, naltrexone, it's optional and it's encouraged, but there's no requirement for counseling. With um, the data, you know, basically a person can, if they have a DEA number that is, um, I'm trying to find my slides, sorry. But if someone is interested in uh, prescribing buprenorphine, or uh, you, you actually don't need anything special to prescribe naltrexone. But if they're interested in prescribing buprenorphine, there's no eight hour training anymore that, or more that um, you have to go through. Um, I would have them contact, uh, I wanna say the, and I don't know, Michael, if you may know more specifically about if they just contact the ASAM? Yeah, I mean, um, what, what I would say is that the, um, so the way, in, in thinking about what happened last year in April of 2021, um, and there was kind of interestingly, prior to the end of the Trump administration, they, they had released something and then the Biden administration had kind of paused and, and we weren't sure what was really gonna happen. And then the, finally the, Kind of buprenorphine guidelines came out in April of 2021, and so the the law in order to change the law that is much more more complicated and difficult. So what what really we saw happen was again, thank you for pulling up the slide, Dr. Wooten, um, is that this counseling requirement um, or, or training requirement was removed, and and I still think it's worthwhile for people to get some education and knowledge. I mean, I think that um, I think it's pretty sad and unfortunate that even with things like oxycodone and other pain meds that there are not really robust training requirements for those types of medications either but i do think that there are and i will say that there are wonderful efforts around the state um you know through some of our different um, partnerships with the governor's institute and other other agencies um just providing different trainings now that we don't necessarily have to provide those you know eight hour or even for our APP colleagues, you know, 24 hours of training, which is just um, hard to fathom. Um, imagine just that time commitment, but um, smaller trainings, an hour or two hours, I definitely think are still worthwhile for people to think about. And we would definitely make a strong statement to say that um, we would never want someone to not get this treatment based on the data that's provided and the evidence because they're not engaged um, in some form of counseling. I will say that I've had many patients who it's taken them five years to get into some sort of therapy or counseling that we thought was beneficial from the beginning of treatment, but it just isn't something that magically happens. And we know that, you know, every day that goes by and someone is exposed to these um, highly potent synthetic opioids, fentanyl, or carfentanyl, um, that the risk of, you know, there may not be time to intervene if someone has an overdose and unfortunately, um, you know, passes away. Uh, and so um, I hope that that um, answers the, the question there regarding waiver and counseling. I think I saw maybe another, something in the chat about extended release naltrexone um, from Dr. Ashton here um, has not been proven to reduce overdose risk. Um, and I will say that the large trials that have come out mm -hmm. about looking at extended release naltrexone and buprenorphine um, there was a recent reanalysis or survival analysis that came out within just the last few months that actually showed that the overdose rates during treatment were, were much higher than originally published. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think that we have to take into account certainly, um, you know, having something like an opioid antagonist like, you know, naltrexone. Um, and if someone suddenly stops that therapy and goes back out and returns to use, they're at an incredibly high risk uh, of overdose due to a loss of tolerance. Um, and, and I've unfortunately have seen that happen, you know, quite a bit in my practice as well for folks that were not interested in methadone or buprenorphine and decided to use, you know, a naltrexone product. So the next question is, I guess, two combined. Um, one of them was, will insurance or Medicaid cover MOUD? And can you also 
mentioned some costs associated with these treatments um, regarding out-of-pocket costs and the costs that are covered by insurance plans that you may be aware of. In general, um, naltrexone is on the expensive side, uh, the, the extended. It is, Vivitrol is an expensive medication. Um, I don't have a breakdown of how the prices go depending on the insurance, but if someone were to pay out of pocket, I would say 800 to a thousand dollars ballpark. Um, with buprenorphine out of pocket, it's well, let me go back. So now Trexone tablets, probably $30 a month out of pocket and cheaper if they use insurance. For buprenorphine, it's not very expensive, but it does vary with the insurances. Um, I, I don't know, I don't have any data specific on how. I, I know some of my uh, patients will share with me different times of the year, oh, you know, my using this pharmacy, this is the cost. So it does vary. Uh, and I'm, I'm not fully sure of the reason of the variability from pharmacy to pharmacy with the same insurance. Okay. Um, the next question, and um, Anna Stanley with the soda office wants to answer this one. Have you used telemental health with MOUD during the pandemic to serve patients? Yes. So telemed uh, has increased uh, tremendously. In my practice currently, I am in office one day a week. I am using telehealth for the rest of my time with, with members. Um, I'm increasingly in office because I'm giving more uh, Sublicade, for example, um, and Vivitrol, but uh, this has been something that's been very beneficial to improving and increasing access. I, I will add to, there was a comment about um, North Carolina Medicaid, which is really wonderful, does cover extended release now, Trexone. I will say that the, the man, again, no disclosures for the manufacturer here, but they, they do have a manufacturer's assistance program. So we work with many uninsured patients. Um, and so you, you can get some support as well from some of the um, manufacturer's programs. Um, and there are ways to develop some partnerships if you're going to consider doing this in the hospital and inpatient settings mm -hmm. um, and outpatient settings uh, as well is, is certainly something uh, to consider. I think the last time I looked um, and the GoodRx prices are changing constantly for buprenorphine, but, uh, you know, it can get as low I've seen um, for even a month's supply of around like 100 to 120 dollars, depending on what pharmacy you go to. The mono product is cheaper, but again, just thinking about things like diversion in the community, the ability to crush, inject um, that mono product is again, something to be mindful of. And I would say in my practice, and um, I'm not sure Dr. Wooten, you know, yours as well, but you know, typically using the combo product, unless there's um, extreme kind of extenuating circumstances where that can't be used or I'm bridging someone um, due to financial limitations or reasons that we need to do that. I agree. Somebody oh, go ahead, mentioned- Dr. I was just going to say, if it's okay if I just add, the cost difference between mono product and combo product is just diminishing at this point. So there is still a cost benefit to mono product, but not much. So it really does decrease benefit of going with mono product. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and then let's see, we've got a couple other questions that we may just need to save in the interest of time, because um, I know that we've got another speaker coming up. Amanda, do you want to continue to answer questions or um, go ahead and save them for the end of the panel? We've got a minute if there's a question that can be addressed quickly. Otherwise, we can hold it. I don't know if anything is a shorter question. There's a really good question, I think, here. And I'm sorry if we're skipping maybe over some, but there's a good question from Victoria about how long should patients continue treatment for? Um, I think this is the biggest thing we all kind of maybe scratch our heads out about a little bit is that I, I think I sort of go back to um, in my primary care practice as we've sort of highlighted and trying to bring that that argument back as well. How long should someone be on insulin for? How long should they be on other forms of therapy or treatment? Okay. And um, I will say that I try to encourage patients not to necessarily have a stop date in mind once they start and they sort of see how they're doing in recovery. Um, if, the, if they're again, seeking things like employment or housing, 
um, that we try to sort of stabilize those things. And again, in my experience, that's been kind of a two to three year process at a minimum, um, sometimes much longer. Um, and so I, I certainly don't believe either and you know, it's forced, forced medication either. So if someone's interested in um, cutting back on their dose or reducing it, I think there's ongoing conversations about risk benefit um, of that. But um, again, if we sort of put this um, it, with other chronic illnesses, again, there I've had some patients, um, Dr. Jordan and I worked together um, during my fellowship, and we had someone who'd been on it for, I think, almost 15 or 18 years and had been doing very well, had no desire to come off of it. I don't think there's absolutely anything wrong with that. Um, if they are getting benefit, they're not having side effects. Um, I certainly think it's another issue if someone starts to experience those things. And the again, the, the risk sort of outweighs the benefit, but um, because the medication is very well tolerated, um, again, you may need to dose adjust over time if there's... Um, you know, certain other biological factors or other issues that are coming into play, um, like sedation or constipation, um, which can be a common side effect. Um, but overall, um, let's, let's try to keep folks on these meds and again, not, not stop them abruptly um, or have sort of arbitrary limits of how long patients should be on them for. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks for addressing that and great discussion, great questions. So at this point, thank you, Dr. Wu, and we're gonna switch gears just a little bit and I'm gonna introduce our next speaker who's my colleague, Mary Beth Cox, who's a substance use epidemiologist with our North Carolina Division of Public Health Injury and Violence Prevention Branch. And she's gonna be talking about updates around our data trends. Thanks, Amanda. I appreciate that introduction. Are you all able to see my slides? Great. Thank you so much. So um, I'm just going to give a quick surveillance update this morning, um, uh, focusing on national and state trends, especially within the last few years, and then kind of dive into what's really driving the epidemic. Um, you've already heard about fentanyl. I'm going to continue to reiterate some of what Dr. Wooten shared and also talk some about what the data are telling us around polysubstance use. And then wanted to wrap up with sharing some of the data resources that we make available so that folks on the call know that um, those are out there and posted and that we are a resource to, to help you in the work that you do. So quickly um, going to the national trends, um, I don't think that this is news to anyone on the, the call. This made a lot of national headlines last fall when the CDC provisional numbers um, were showing that we were unfortunately setting the sad record of over 100,000 overdose deaths in a year. This is that um, kind of first 12 month period um, at the start of the pandemic. So really saw this national spike in overdose deaths with the pandemic. As Dr. Wooten talked about a, a syndemic and um, an epidemic within a pandemic, this overdose epidemic and COVID-19. Uh, this increase was about um, estimated to be about 39% nationally. And unfortunately, North Carolina did experience a similar increase. So um, our, our 2020 death data were just very recently finalized. And so we're starting to update all our resources and really look at the impacts in that first year of the pandemic. But we did have that um, over 3,000 deaths, a 40% increase in 2020, which came after we saw our first decrease in overdose deaths in many, many years um, back in 2018, and then kind of a, a plateau in 2019. Um, so it's unfortunate to see that large increase in 2020. As I mentioned, the, the death data take a really long time to finalize. We just got final 2020 data, but um, we look to our emergency department visit data to get um, kind of an idea of what's happening more in real time. So uh, unfortunately, we're seeing in the emergency department data and provisional death data that this increase continued into 2021. So this is uh, year over year ED visits for drug overdose. And you can see almost 16,000 um, overdose visits in 2021, which was a 7% increase over 2020, um, especially alarming considering the 23% increase that we had already seen in 2020. So those numbers um, continued to rise in 2021. And to get at what's really driving this epidemic, um, we've already talked about, you've heard about the potency of fentanyl and why it's so dangerous. So I'll, I'll skip on to some of the trends in our state. This is just to orient everyone to this graph. This is the last 10 years of overdose deaths in North Carolina. Um, 
starting here in 2011 with about 1,200 overdose deaths, going to 2020 with over 3,000. The lighter blue portion are the deaths that did not have any fentanyl involvement. And then this darker blue portion are deaths that did have fentanyl involvement. So you can just see that growing over time. Um, and it looks like my, my label was actually cut off here, but in this 61% was involvement in 2019 and 2020, it was actually 73% of overdose deaths in the state um, involved fentanyl. So definitely an epidemic, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, an epidemic that's driven by fentanyl, but we're seeing increases uh, across the board in the surveillance data. So this is um, still using death data, uh, looking at what substances were involved in overdose deaths. Again, you see by and large, the majority of these deaths involving fentanyl in um, especially recent years, but we're seeing increases kind of across the board in all the substances that we're tracking here, but I especially wanted to draw everyone's attention to uh, the increases in stimulants. So in the, the last couple of years, seeing the rise of um, cocaine and methamphetamine involvement in overdose deaths. Uh, it is worth noting, though, that these uh, lines are not mutually exclusive. So if an individual had um, both fentanyl and cocaine in their system at the time of death, they would be included in both of the lines on this chart. And that happens more and more often. Um, the majority of overdose deaths do involve multiple substances. Um, in 2020 in North Carolina, 66% of overdose deaths had at least two substances on board at the time of death, um, oftentimes even more. Um, We've done some deep dives looking at different trends in drug combinations, demographics of individuals using different combinations, um, published on that last year. So I encourage you to check that article out if you're interested in learning more. Um, but really, it, it all still goes back to fentanyl as that driving force. Um, fentanyl was involved in 87% um, of opioid overdoses, over 70% of stimulant overdoses, and then um, over 60% of you know, other prescription overdoses. So 67% of benzodiazepine overdoses also had fentanyl involvement. 66% of anti-epileptic overdoses like gabapentin um, also had fentanyl involved. So um, really, I think speaking to the importance of interventions like uh, distributing fentanyl test strips so that folks can know what's in the product, what they're using. Um, I don't know from death certificate data whether or not this um, polysubstance use, use of multiple substances at a time, whether or not that was intentional or um, so if they used it knowingly or unknowingly, if someone purchased cocaine, um, thinking that it was just a stimulant, but it was laced with fentanyl and then they overdose, I'm not able to know that level of detail from a death certificate. We just know that these substances um, were involved in the death. I also wanted to just take a, a quick moment to mention um, a pilot program that's happening across the state in a couple of um, locations. And I can, if folks are interested in learning more about this, I can drop a link in the chat after my presentation. But this is a, um, a pilot drug checking program that's happening in collaboration with um, some colleagues, um, harm reduction colleagues and UNC. And they are um, trying to go beyond fentanyl test strips and really test the product for any emerging substance that might be present and have found some uh, alarming trends seeing things like xylazine, uh, which is a veterinary tranquilizer um, showing up last year in the supply. Also um, niacin, uh, vitamin B3 showing up and these can have um, some scary side effects. And of course, people may not know that that's what they're taking. So um, hoping to really try to promote programs like this and really helps us also um, keep surveillance going of these new and emerging substances that might be making it into the supply. So speaking of surveillance, I just wanted to wrap up by sharing the resources that we make available um, through our unit. The first being these monthly surveillance reports. So I already mentioned that uh, emergency department data are our most timely way to track the overdose epidemic. So every month we put out several different reports, um, a couple focused on opioids, some um, larger with any drug involvement, but looking at those ED visits um, and what happened last month. We also have a new report, this one in the center here that I wanted to highlight 
This is in collaboration with partners at the um, Chief Medical Examiner's Office. And we've tried to develop a way to do more timely surveillance of fatal overdose. So this is um, not confirmed cases because as I mentioned, it takes a, a long time to investigate and finalize these overdose deaths. But this is looking at a suspected, a count of suspected overdoses so that we're able to look back at the month prior and um, hopefully again, do more timely surveillance of fatal overdoses. So these monthly reports, some are available at county level. Um, they're posted to our website. We we also send out an email update when they go live. So um, I'll, I'll share an email address at the end if you'd like to join that listserv if you're not already on it. Um, the other resource I wanted to share was our is our data dashboard. This is the department's opioid and substance use action plan data dashboard. There's a lot of information in this dashboard, lots of different pages here. And I just wanted to kind of quickly walk folks through what you might be able to find and how you could use this. But a lot of introduction um, materials. Why, like, why do, why are we tracking the overdose epidemic? Why are we tracking these different metrics? Um, some orientation around the state's action plan. There's also a how to use page with a tutorial video walkthrough. And I, I like to highlight this page because it also has a data download function. So if you're wanting to um, do your own analysis, make your own graphics, you're able to download the data set into Excel and do that for yourself. There's all of the, the data that are being tracked in the by the action plan are organized into strategy areas. And um, we're tracking 14 different metrics. So these are kind of like health outcome data, um, overdose death, ED visits, hepatitis C infections, reversal data, um, 14 different health outcomes. And we're also tracking 14 different local actions. And so this is um, things like what programs are counties doing? Do they have a syringe service program? Is your, uh, your county or different organizations in your county distributing naloxone? And you can go to the dashboard and we're trying to really pair the health outcome data with the programmatic side of things like what prevention efforts are happening on the ground. So you can get a quick overview of the data and the actions or drill down and look at um, just one metric, one data point, or just an action if you wanted. These last two pages allow you to compare both the, the health outcome data and the actions data, compare what's going on in your county or region to either the state as a whole, or you can choose a, a neighboring county to see kind of um, if any programs are happening in your neighboring counties that you might be interested in. So you can do that comparison on the dashboard. And really to wrap up, I wanted to kind of zoom in on this third page. This is the newest page that we've added to the data dashboard. And it came out of the eighth strategy to be added to the state action plan. Um, last year, the plan was updated to include a new um, focus area, a new strategy on centering equity and lived experience and really across the plan and all of the work that we do. And so from a, a data standpoint, that looks like um, making sure that we're analyzing trends by different demographics and thinking about how this epidemic might impact different populations in different ways. So this data is, um, these data are currently up on the dashboard. It's only at a state level right now, but we are working right now to add in a page that would allow you to see this at a county level so that you can look at disparities in your county or region. I'm going to just zoom in on these two figures to kind of, um, they, they look really blurry, blurry there when I zoom in, but I think you can get the, the major take home point here, just reminding everyone of why this is so important to do these demographic breakdowns, because um, we often talk about this epidemic, or it's, it's often portrayed in the media as a white male problem, and if we just looked at the the numbers, the raw numbers, the counts, that would be true in North Carolina, but it's not at an accurate representation of how populations are impacted. So if we adjust um, by population size and look at rates, we see that, um, that uh, American Indian indigenous populations in North Carolina have much higher rates than any other um, population in our state. And um, other historically marginalized populations like non-Hispanic Black communities actually have, um, while their rates are lower, they're increasing faster than rates in some other populations. And finally, this figure, um, just looking at the different 
the involvement of different substances by race and ethnicity, and remembering that intervention and prevention might look different in different communities because different populations use different substances and use substances differently. Um, so it's, it just varies across the board, but I will kind of um, once more reiterate, fentanyl is still though the driving force. So this red bar, the first one in each of these um, demographic groups is by and large the, the highest um, drug that's involved. So um, still driving, the driving force in all of these populations is um, fentanyl. So I'll just leave you all with, the link to our overdose data page here when you are able to access the slides or you can Google um, Injury and Violence Prevention Branch and find us hopefully pretty easily. All the resources I mentioned are posted to this website. You can email us at substance use data for um, if you can't find an answer to a question, if you'd like to be added to our listserv to get these updates, um, or we do special data requests. So if uh, we can't always answer everything, but if you have a question or a, a need for your funding opportunities, um, please reach out to us, we're a resource for you. And um, also always happy to take feedback on, on what we're producing because we want it to be helpful to um, you all who are really doing this work every day. So I think I'd love to send enough um, time for just a couple of questions. I'll turn it back over to the SODA team. Thanks, Mary Beth. That was awesome. Um, that was great. So a couple of questions. Are there any data comparing overdose incidents um, between people who are enrolled in treatment programs versus incidents for people who are not in treatment? Yeah, that's not something that we uh, that I'm aware of, there may be special studies that address that. Um, the first thing that's coming to mind, and it's not going to look at overdose rates, um, we do share information in the data dashboard looking at um, Medicaid beneficiaries and um, uninsured population who are receiving treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, also share some data around buprenorphine dispensing, but as a at the state level and the data that I have access to, um, it's oftentimes de-identified, like aggregate level or um, any sort of identifier is wiped clean. So it's harder to do that like linkage across um, different data sets. So like who's getting treatment and then looking at the death data or the ED data for um, an actual overdose event. Yeah, that would be pretty difficult to get. Um, another question, are all of the monthly reports not mutually exclusive? For example, are the numbers for opioid overdoses versus opioid medications with the potential de for dependency reflecting the same individuals or are they separate? Yeah, that's a great question. So the those they're all green, the opioid reports. So that is a subset of the medication um, drug report, the blue reports that we put out. And so there is a graph on that medication drug report that looks at the breakdown by substance type. It's very similar to the death data that I was showing um, earlier in my presentation, but there's a line for different opioids, um, prescription opioids, fentanyl involvement, as well as cocaine, methamphetamine. And so all of those would roll up into that larger medication and drug with potential for abuse report. And then because opioids are still the primary driver, we do a kind of zoom in on that subset of opioids. Okay, um, just wanna pause to see if there are any more questions. Great, thank you, Mary Beth, for that presentation. The dashboard has a wealth of information if you haven't already seen it. Um, the link is in the chat, and if, as Mary Beth mentioned, if you have additional data needs, we'll put the um, email address for our team in there as well. So we'll hear from our last set of speakers now who will be presenting on settings where medications for opioid use disorder can be provided and how changes in the drug supply have affected treatment practices. So we're happy to have with us Dr. Dana Burson, who's the medical director of Mountain Health Solutions Opioid Treatment Program in North Wilkesboro, and also has her own office-based practice in Lake Norman, as well as Dr. Robin Jordan, who is the medical director of the UNC Addiction Medicine Program and serves as the program director Director for the UNC Addiction Medicine Fellowship, which she established in 2018. We're glad to have you both, and we'll pass it to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking me to talk to this um, committee. I think it's important work that you're doing. 
And uh, thank you to Dr. Wooten. You did a wonderful summary of our opioid situation and the existing treatments and the um, medications so that um, I think there's some overlap. So I'm going to have more time to maybe dig down into specific, um, spe some more specific issues. Um, hopefully by the end of this presentation, participants will be able to enhance their utilization of both opioid treatment programs and office space settings as partners in the treatment of opioid use disorder. And they'll be able to describe the different levels of care in treating addictions. And then Dr. Jordan is gonna talk about how fentanyl has impacted suboxone induction and also a protocol for the micro induction of buprenorphine, which is certainly something new. Um, neither one of us have disclosures. So just like Dr. Wooten said, we have three FDA approved medica medications to treat opioid use disorder. So first I'm gonna talk about methadone and some more details about opioid treatment programs. I started working at an opioid treatment program in 2001 and was amazed at how much data there was to support what we were doing there. And I had worked 10 years in primary care, had never heard about all this data. Um, and I just became enamored of the way patients improve so rapidly. So I've worked in opioid treatment programs ever since 2001 and started prescribing buprenorphine products from an office-based setting in 2006. Um, so like Dr. Wooten said, this medication has been around for a long time. We have decades and reams of information to show how it works and how it, it provides treatment to patients with opioid use disorder. For the purpose of treating opioid use disorder, it can only be provided in an opioid treatment program. Methadone can be prescribed in an office, but only for the treatment of pain. And there's some dangers with it because it is such a long acting medication. If it's misused, there's great potential for overdose. If you'll recall around the mid aughts, 2007, we had a lot of methadone overdoses in this state, largely from pain clinics who were encouraged to use it because it's so cheap. Um, but then we saw the um, downside that uh, it can also be deadly if it's misused. Next slide, please. So methadone does not cause precipitated withdrawal with that instead of like it should be with fentanyl or other opiates. You don't have to worry about causing precipitated withdrawal, which is one way in which it's different from buprenorphine. The induction has to be done with caution, like I said, because of the long half-life. And because it's a full opiate, it can cause more respiratory depression. Even with these drawbacks, we have decades of studies to show that methadone used to treat opioid use disorder so shows a reduction in death three to eight times patients with opioid use disorder who are not in treatment. And we see similar results with the um, buprenorphine products as well. So take a moment and imagine if there was a medication that could reduce death in diabetics by three to eight fold and providers did not use it, what would we think? That would be malpractice. Yet there's such a stigma against these medications to treat opioid use disorder. Uh, patients are discouraged all the time to stop their medications, their buprenorphine or methadone. So opioid treatment programs have a long history of treating um, opioid use disorder. And like Dr. Wooten mentioned, they're heavily regulated by both federal and state authorities, including the DEA. The system has more patient accountability and more patient contact built in. Um, I think I prefer to treat patients at an OTP because it feels more like a team. There's the medical providers, but there's also the counselors and the nurses, and we're all working together. And I really prefer a more collaborative environment um, and that we have more contact with the patient. There's daily dosing, at least initially. Gradually, the patients can get take-homes. But there's a mandated minimum number of individual sessions um, and programs vary considerably about how much, uh, how, how intense their counseling is and how much group counseling they have but there's a minimum number of drug screens and all this accountability is built into the system. And I see that as the biggest advantage of an OTP. There's closer monitoring and more accountability. And here's some um, data from North Carolina. 
As of early this month, we have 84 opioid treatment programs in North Carolina. I got this data from Smith Worth, who's the head of SOTA. And we're serving nearly 22,000 patients. And that number increased during COVID. Um, I think some individual office-based programs uh, closed or had difficulty staying open. And I know our program got some referrals uh, during that time. Opioid treatment programs have uh, distributed, um, I think it was 31, 32,000 Narcan kits to their patients. I think that the funds were provided through North Carolina De Department of Health and Human Service. And it's been a godsend. Every day I hear of somebody who's reversed an overdose and that's good. The more kits we get out into the community, the better chance that these that patients have of being revived and they get a second chance. Next slide, please. So this is data from NC Tops. All treatment programs in the state, I think, um, fill out this data. It stands for Treatment Outcomes and Program Performance System. So the most recent data on the information from gathered from opioid treatment programs showed that 98% of patients said their quality of life had improved. 48% had reduction in moderate to severe mental health issues, and we saw 50% fewer arrests, 97% drop in suicide attempts, 45% drop in homelessness, 53% um, drop in ER visits, and a 36% drop in unemployment. Next slide, please. So let me now shift over to the office-based programs and how they're a little different. Um, buprenorphine is a partial agonist, as we heard, um, it's usually very well tolerated with minimal side effects. It's patients who've been on both methadone and Suboxone say that they feel lighter and less medicated on the Suboxone. But then the downside is that it's not strong enough for certain patients. Um, you don't develop a tolerance with either methadone or Suboxone. In other words, if you get to a stabilizing dose, you do not have to keep increasing the dose. Um, the longer they've been on it, like you would see with um, short acting pain pills. Um, and in an opioid tolerant person, it's, it's next to impossible to overdose on Suboxone alone. However, if the patient mixes it with uh, sedatives, including alcohol, they can still overdose. But it is life-saving for patients with opioid use disorder. And you can see from this slide, we have many studies over a long period of time. Um, and it's only been out since, two, it's really only been available. Data 2000 was passed in 2000, of course, but it wasn't really available in the pharmacies till 2001, 2002. So for the short amount of time that we've had it available, we've had many studies showing its benefit. Um, and buprenorphine products can be offered both at office-based programs and opioid treatment programs. And I wanted to talk about some of the differences. Um, in office-based programs, you, the providers do not have to follow the regulations of an opioid treatment program. Physicians and other providers can see patients as often or as little as they feel is medically indicated. Costs can vary, but North Carolina Medicaid will pay for treatment and will pay for medication, including the sublocade. And both the sublingual and the injection can be prescribed in this setting. Some OBOTs, office-based programs, uh, offer on-site groups, individual counseling. Some are integrated into primary care or psychiatric care. And depending on the setting, the providers will vary in how comfortable they are treating mental illness or physical illness. For example, my background is internal medicine. If I get a patient who is having significant mental illness, I, I am probably going to have to refer that patient somewhere else uh, for their mental health care. I'll still see them for their uh, opioid use disorder. And sometimes uh, if the patient has a very severe polysubstance use disorder, um, the provider at an office-based program may feel uncomfortable. But the biggest advantage of this is um, just having more flexibility to meet the patient's needs. So, People ask, which is best, an opioid treatment program or an OBOT? And the answer is both. <laughs> treatment is best. 
Um, and I feel we should use a chronic disease model. Like Dr. Wooten said, this is a chronic disease. It's subject to relapse. And so um, just like you would with an asthmatic, if they have very mild treatment, perhaps they can be treated by primary care. If they have very severe treatment, maybe they need to see a pulmonologist. If they're having an acute flare, maybe they need to, to go inpatient at a hospital. It's the same way with opioid use disorder. And hopefully we're gonna fit the treatment setting to the needs of the patient. Patients with more severe illness needing higher levels of care. Um, in just a word, um, you know, not all programs are excellent programs. Even the ones who are suboptimal, though, we've, sh we've seen that the medication itself saves lives, although we should always encourage treatment programs to provide the very best of evidence-based treatment. So when I talk to a patient who is considering treatment, what, what kind of things do we discuss about how to decide which is best? And often it's driven by what the patient wants. Um, patients have strong preferences as to which medication they want, usually based on past experiences. Um, they may prefer one mode of treatment over another. Sometimes, and Dr. Jordan will talk more about this, patients who are heavy users of fentanyl can have a difficult time initiating buprenorphine. And we also need to consider affordability. Um, costs vary between programs. And we have to take that into account, whether they have insurance or if they're covered by Medicaid. I can tell you at our opioid treatment program, roughly half have no insurance at all. They don't qualify for Medicare or Medicaid. And also accessibility with an opioid treatment program, if they live too far away, it's not going to be practical for them to drive to and from the clinic when they first start out. And of course, telemedicine has really expanded and offered us so many ways to be more creative about how we contact our patients. We also need to consider wait time for admission. Is there same day admission? In other words, if the patient calls up, can they, can they see a provider that day and get started on medication? Um, and again, transportation, childcare issues. What is a young mother seeking treatment? What does she do with her children while she's seeing the provider? Is there, are there options for her at the program? So I think the best level of care is the one you can engage the patient in. And ideally, we should be able to move patients back and forth uh, according to their need. And so how do we do that? We haven't, at least opioid treatment programs have been so siloed away from the rest of the medical community for so long. It, it doesn't change overnight, but I think we can do better better jobs of reaching out to our office-based providers in the community. Um, office-based providers need to know where the OTPs are and, and how to refer someone. Um, so it's just a, the slow process of breaking down these silos. And I have some ideas about this, things like this meeting, uh, things like the regional and state meetings that NCASAM um, sponsors with, that are facilitated by the Governor's Institute. Office-based providers can contact the State Opioid Treatment Authority for locations and then contact information about uh, where's the closest opioid treatment program, how can I contact that me the medical director there, and how can I transfer patients back and forth. We shouldn't look at each other as competitors, We, because Lord knows there's enough patients to go around. We really need to be working together. I'd, I'd like to tell you um, an example, a case study of one of my patients who was able to successfully transfer from levels of care. This is Tina, it's not her real name, um, 30 years old with an eight year history of opioid use disorder. She was referred by her probation officer, which is thrilling when you have probation and parole referring patients. She had some drug charges and she lost custody of her daughter and was referred to us with a positive drug screen for opioids by her PO. Um, at that time, we had the Matt Padoa grant, which is a criminal justice grant. Um, and she was able to be admitted and have all of her treatment fees paid for by that grant. She stabilized on 16 milligrams, attended daily for the first several months. She did have some positive drug screen at first, um, but she participated in counseling and she did all the parenting classes that were recommended. Next slide, please. And eventually she did regain full custody of her daughter. That grant ended and Tina still didn't have 
um, health insurance to pay for treatment, but another grant became available that paid for medication at the pharmacy through Project Lazarus as a local organization here. So she transitioned from the opioid treatment program to our office-based arm at the OTP. And we call that our transition program. And at this point, she hasn't used illicit opiates in more than three years. Her ultimate goal is to be off all medication, but right now we've discussed it. She doesn't feel ready to taper off. She feels like it provides a safety net and she wants to build more time in recovery. And I'm completely supportive of that. Uh, like Dr. Wooten said, you, you shouldn't have just an arbitrary uh, number for the number of months or years the patient is on treatment. It just it's, needs to be patient-centered and patient-focused. Her five-year-old daughter is adorable and well-loved and cared for, and she just started in community college, enrolled in medical billing and coding, and she scored a 97% on her first exam. She was thrilled. So that's a, a nice success story. And I'm just gonna talk for a few minutes about um, another issue recently is reducing barriers to treatment. One of the patients said, I wish it was easy to get treatment as it is to get heroin. And that really should be our goal or maybe easier. We know from studies that only 20% of people with opioid use disorder are getting treatment. So 80% of people are at, at high risk. Anything we can do to reduce the obstacles and raise that percentage of people in treatment will improve outcomes. As, as we have pointed out before, the risk of death and untreated treatment is very high. So this article by Jay Kubowski et al. had some specific ideas. This was from 2020. Um, the author advocated same day admission into treatment. Uh, in other words, if the patient calls, trying to get the patient seen and treated that day. I know uh, when COVID started at the opioid treatment program, we were doing intakes two or three days a week after COVID, we went to four days a week and we've reached a whole lot more patients. Um, same day treatment is a little more complicated with um, heavy fentanyl use, but again, Dr. Jordan will talk more about that. The author of this uh, journal article also advocated harm reduction. In other words, don't kick patients out of treatment for drug use when they're there to get treated for drug use. Um, Studies definitely show if you can retain that person in treatment, they will have better outcomes. And of course, we need to have a non-judgmental attitude, regard this as one chronic illness, just like every other chronic illness that we treat. We need to do all we can to reduce stigma and we need to be open about discussing the patient's goals. And if we have a patient who we feel isn't doing well, use our skills at trying to engage them in the decision to go to a higher level of care. Um, we get much better results if we're more collaborative. And flexibility is important. Some programs have pretty heavy obligations right up front. They tell their patients they have to go to intensive outpatient counseling before they can get medication. And that's really not evidence-based. Um, it may deter patients from coming to treatment. There's nothing wrong with intensive outpatient programs. That's a good thing, but if it's a barrier to getting the medication, it may not be so good. So we should be willing to modify treatment to um, be better flexible with the patient's needs. And the more variety of places where treatment can be accessed, the better. Um, of course, that was the whole idea of Data 2000, having um, primary care available to do uh, opioid use disorder treatment. But perhaps we can get more creative and have them at needle exchanges, um, homeless healthcare sites, um, and other creative ideas. So I'd like to float the idea that opioid treatment programs can, can lower their barriers. We'll probably never be low barrier, but there's things that we can do to uh, encourage our patients to come to treatment. Um, this, doing all we can to have multiple admission days during the week, uh, elimination of the admission fee, and participation in grant programs is very important. I asked our, um, med our um, program director, we've got 575 patients, 44% of them are getting their treatment paid for by the state opioid, um, the, the SOAR grant. And that's really been a godsend to each one of those patients. There's some exciting changes around the use of mobile vans to uh, reach remote areas, even with methadone. There's ways you can do that safely. 
Of course, with the methadone, there, there may need to be higher barriers for take-home doses for safety issues, but under the new rules since COVID, there's been, um, people are taking a second look at that to see how we can still be safe, but give more take-home doses. Because studies show that if you can be more flexible and give more doses, it retains patients in treatment. Um, using guest doses and exceptions for take-homes. And now I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Jordan. I think we'll have time for questions at the end. But um, now over to Robin. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Verson. And so we're going to shift gears just a little bit here. We're going to talk about um, fentanyl and uh, how fentanyl has really uh, impacted addiction treatment. And so a couple of um, uh, disclosures here. So um, uh, we're talking about buprenorphine naloxone. So from here forward, that's what I'm discussing, but buprenorphine naloxone is a lot to say. So I'm just gonna call it suboxone. So if you'll tolerate that, it's just for ease. Um, and then we're at this transition point right now. So what I'm gonna discuss is what we're doing at our addiction medicine program. What I'm going to discuss is not necessarily evidence-based yet because there is not evidence-based for what we're in the middle of right now. So we're in the process of building the evidence evidence. Um, I'll provide uh, information on what we're doing, and there needs to be understanding that what we're doing is going to change. So we're meeting the need at the moment, and the need continues to evolve, and what we're doing is going to have to continue to evolve. So just understanding that what I'm presenting today could be very different from what we're doing six months from now. So um, what happened with this fentanyl evolution, uh, and, and why is fentanyl such a problem in the last uh, really year to one to two years? So we had our COVID shutdowns globally across the world, and when we, when we did that, we interrupted supply chains from China, and so other countries like Mexico took advantage. And so methamphetamine was the first thing that began to flood our market, and many of you out there probably saw this. In 2020, we saw a lot more methamphetamine which we believe came from Mexico. And it's not the methamphetamine people make in their bathtubs. This is a far more potent methamphetamine that's being synthesized and brought in. What has also changed is that illicit drugs can contain anything. And so this was referenced earlier as well. It has become really difficult to purchase a specific drug um, because a high fraction of drugs now are contaminated with other drugs. So um, marijuana, even just marijuana, can have fentanyl or methamphetamine in it. Cocaine is likely going to have fentanyl or methamphetamine in it. Methamphetamine is likely going to have cocaine or fentanyl in it. And then even pain pills. So if someone's thinking, I'm just buying Percocet from somebody. Pain pills, they have these presses that make them look just like oxycodone. And the pain pills are um, now pressed and manufactured to contain fentanyl. And so this is the reason that these, um, uh, I'll tell you more, this is part of the reason uh, that, that fentanyl is driving the overdoses right now. And then um, the other part are these fentanyl analogs, which is um, really what's causing us a problem in the treatment world. So what is the problem with these fentanyl analogs? So the fentanyl analogs, their properties appear to be different. We, we don't know is, is the short of it, um, but there seems to be something different with these fentanyl analogs. And what we do know is that they hang around on the opioid receptor a very long time, up to three weeks. So we at least know that. And we know that it complicates suboxone induction, which I'll tell you about, um, but that makes it difficult. Now in the outpatient setting, it was just super easy. Somebody comes in, they have opioid use disorder, they're using heroin, we have a discussion, we give them suboxone, we're done, it's great. They get on it and, and uh, get on suboxone and it works very well. That's not the case today. Now, if with people using fentanyl, using fentanyl analogs, it is more difficult to get people onto suboxone. So we're gonna discuss that. And so our traditional methods of suboxone induction still exist and we can still use them, but those traditional methods are not reliable for people who are using fentanyl because of these new fentanyl analogs. So we're going to talk about this evolution of buprenorphine inductions, and we're going to do just a touch of um, background knowledge here. And so this is an important part to understand why we're having this problem. So we're going to talk about opioid withdrawal. And um, so we're going to talk about opioids that are binding the opioid receptor. Pick your opioid, doesn't matter what it is, heroin, fentanyl, oxycodone, doesn't matter. It binds the opioid receptor. And then for whatever reason, 
opioids are discontinued. So whatever reason they're stopped, you ran out, you can't find a supply. Uh, but the opioids will slowly leave that opioid receptor. And as they slowly come off of the receptor, withdrawal starts to set in. And then we all know the signs of opioid withdrawal, and those were highlighted earlier this morning. And then peak withdrawal occurs 36 to 48 hours. So peak withdrawal is the vomiting, diarrhea, laying in the floor, wanting to die. Peak withdrawal is what people will do many things um, to avoid. Uh, peak withdrawal is where most people with opioid use disorder can't even get to that point on their own because it's so incredibly uncomfortable. So normal, this is the normal withdrawal process and this is how long it takes. There's this other concept called precipitated withdrawal that involves buprenorphine itself. I have Suboxone here because that's what we're talking about, but people confuse this with the quote unquote, the blocker in Suboxone. And it's not that, it is actually buprenorphine that is causing the precipitated withdrawal. And so again, start with an opioid, binding the opioid receptor, pick your opioid, doesn't matter what it is. And then, uh, so the opioid's on the receptor and then you give somebody Suboxone. That's a problem. The suboxone is immediately going to kick any of those opioids off of the receptor. That's going to cause uh, what we call precipitated withdrawal. And what that means is withdrawal occurs in minutes. And so if you can imagine in the other scenario, it taking up to 48 hours for peak withdrawal. And now in this scenario, it could take five to 10 minutes for peak withdrawal. So someone is totally fine. 10 minutes later, they're vomiting, diarrhea, laying on the floor, wanting to die. That's a really horrible experience. And so if, you, if someone is taking opioids, you give them Suboxone, you can precipitate withdrawal. This is something we've known for, for a very long time. And this is um, why we have protocols of how to start Suboxone to avoid precipitated withdrawal. Now, some will say, what's the big deal? Precipitated withdrawal is not going to kill you, but it is a big deal. Um, it won't kill you, but it will make you want to die. Um, just had a patient say, it's brutal. Um, we know it is a really horrible experience. The, I think the bigger um, uh, potential outcome of this is uh, Suboxone is a life-saving medicine. And if you precipitate withdrawal with somebody, they're gonna not want to take Suboxone. So you've potentially removed a life-saving option for that patient. And then for patients in the hospital, if you precipitate withdrawal in the hospital, they may be inclined to leave the hospital against medical advice. This is what happened to us last year with these fentanyl analogs where we precipitated withdrawal four patients in a row um, unintentionally, but these fentanyl analogs changed the story for us. All four of those patients, uh, three of them did leave the hospital against medical advice. One tried to, but was IBC'd and couldn't. So, um, you know, somebody, if they need to be in the hospital for treatment, you don't want them leaving the hospital. So, so precipitating withdrawal is not trivial. And we really should do what we can to avoid that so that we're making sure people have access to life-saving treatment. So let's talk about suboxone induction and how this evolution has impacted us. So 2003 to 2016-ish, so somewhere in that 14, 15, 16, 17 range. So we're just gonna call it 2016-ish was before fentanyl. And these were the days where starting Suboxone was easy. So we knew we didn't want to precipitate withdrawal. And so you could do a time-based induction and you would say, uh, we're gonna initiate Suboxone eight to 24 hours after your last use of opioids. So you just need to be in a mild to moderate withdrawal. Um, after eight hours, you can take your Suboxone dose. Or we could say it was symptom-based and say, um, you need to have this many signs of withdrawal, you can give them a scale to use, and if your score is a certain score, um, then, then you can start your Suboxone. So this was easy, and this worked um, for quite a while, and this is what we call um, uh, a standard induction. And so our process was super straightforward. You start with a four milligram dose of Suboxone, you give them an eight milligram dose after that, and then you keep them on Suboxone to your next appointment. So this is what we call a standard induction. And we can still do standard inductions. People in the community can still do standard inductions. It's just that fentanyl analogs are making standard inductions more challenging. 
So for us, for again, this is what I'm saying, this is what the addiction medicine program is doing. Uh, we will still do uh, standard inductions if we know the patient is not using illicit drugs. So the patient, I usually now is the patient in the hospital where it's a controlled environment and we know what they're using, or a patient that for whatever reason is very clear to us that they're withdrawing from prescribed opioids and not using illicit drugs. Then we'll go with a standard induction. So um, time passes, and again, this is 2016-ish to 2021, um, and this was the era, I'm calling this the era of prescribed fentanyl. So the fentanyl that came from uh, drug companies. And so fentanyl kind of came out onto the market, and initially it was like, well, this is a problem um, because uh, we saw very quickly if someone's taking fentanyl, um, uh, it is a little harder for a patient to get on Suboxone. And it became very, we could no longer time base. It used to be, you know, wait eight hours and take your suboxone dose. But if they were using fentanyl, they were precipitating withdrawal after eight hours. So it just became very simple. We said, okay, we can no longer time base starting suboxone. Now we just symptom base. So we just moved to these symptom based inductions. When you have so many symptoms on your withdrawal scale, then you can go ahead and start Suboxone. So instead of eight hours, it might be 24 hours, 36 hours, but now it's dependent on your symptoms of withdrawal as opposed to just a time scale. So that was a very quick and easy solution we were able to come up with. So we were able to manage uh, fentanyl during that time. Um, this protocol itself, we know we at addiction medicine program no longer use because this is where we're having problems today um, with the uh, fentanyl analogs. So 2021, for my opinion, that it was around spring one year ago that we started having trouble, which we now know is these fentanyl analogs that were brought to our market. And so with these fentanyl analogs, someone can be in quite a bit of withdrawal and we give them Suboxone, which should be enough, we should be able to do that, and we still precipitate withdrawal. And so we don't know why, like if somebody is, it's been three days, they have all the symptoms of withdrawal and you still give them Suboxone and you make withdrawal worse, it doesn't add up to us. We don't know why that's happening. But what we do know is that we have to change our practices very fast um, because uh, now it's just made it very difficult to get somebody on Suboxone successfully. So what we have, us and others, um, have looked at now micro and macro induction protocols. So I'm going to tell you mostly about the micro induction, then we're going to touch on macro induction. Micro induction protocols um, is that you start with a teeny tiny little dose of Suboxone. Others start at lower doses. I'm just showing, sharing what we're doing, and uh, we start at 0.5 milligrams. And you just sequentially increase, just double the dose every day until you get to a dose of eight milligrams BID. And then once you're at day three or four of this protocol, you can start weaning the other opioids that the person is taking. And um, then they can get on Suboxone without precipitating withdrawal, but with microinduction without any withdrawal. So it's actually really, really nice. So, um, and for those of you who, uh, prescribe uh, the protocols we use are at the end of this presentation. So um, for UNC, we are using suboxone microinduction in the hospital setting. And um, there are not big studies yet showing definitive protocols of how to do mi microinduction. And still, majority of the studies are case studies. And so us and many others are really working on coming out with some good studies that show um, how you can use these uh, induction protocols. And so here's what we've learned at this point. Suboxone microinduction, um, we assume, we just start out with this assumption, all illicit drugs are gonna contain fentanyl analogs. So we're at that point now, if you're using illicit drugs, we're gonna assume there's fentanyl analog. And that if you're using a fentanyl analog, you're gonna have difficulty adequately um, getting into enough withdrawal for a regular Suboxone induction. So then as we said, microinduction uses these tiny amounts of Suboxone where you just gradually increase the Suboxone. Um, and then the patient can decrease their opioids once the buprenorphine or Suboxone is a high enough dose. So for us, once the dose is around four to eight milligrams a day is when other opioids can be tapered. And so what we have learned is this is very effective in a hospital setting. 
hospital settings are controlled settings. We know what's going on and uh, we're seeing the patient every day, super effective in the hospital setting. We've also learned the patient needs to be in the hospital at least four days for this six day protocol um, because the protocol just becomes challenging to, um, to, to continue if they leave the hospital before the four days. Um, we've also learned, make sure you check the talk screen. If the talk screen has fentanyl, for us in the hospital, our rule is you absolutely do microinduction. And we've also learned, interestingly, microinduction has no impact on how much NMEs the patients prescribe. We've done this on patients on lots and lots of opioids, patients on um, PCA pumps, and it doesn't matter how much opioids they're taking, um, this induction process works. So um, we know you must start at 0 0.5 milligrams. People will say, I'll micro do a micro induction at two milligrams. That will not work for us. 0 0.5 milligrams, you cannot start higher. You can't speed the process up. We've tried this as well. For us in our protocol, it takes six days. We've not been able to figure out how to make it quicker. Very, it's very successful in the hospital setting. And we use this for any patients we know um, uh, have uh, fentanyl or for us if we're assuming they have fentanyl. So I'm telling you all this about the hospital setting. Well, what about the outpatient setting? And unfortunately today, I have to tell you, we're still learning. And I, I would prefer to be able to tell you, here's what we do, but we're just not at that point yet. So in the outpatient setting, people are looking at microinduction uh, protocols and some people are using them and some people are um, uh, doing fine with them. Our personal experience is that microdosing in the outpatient setting has just not been as successful. It takes a highly motivated patient. Our experience is it takes another person in their lives to help manage um, the induction process. The person has to self taper off of their fentanyl. That's really where we've had the biggest challenge. And we've had patients where we've tried this and they either don't come back, which is a good sign that something didn't work, or they come back on fentanyl and suboxone, which is obviously not the goal. So once we realized microinduction wasn't working in the outpatient setting, we quickly switched and said, let's see if these macro induction protocols are going to work. Macro induction, what I will say, this is all I'm going to say about at this point, it's giving, it's starting with a large dose of Suboxone um, and uh, uh, quickly getting them onto, um, onto Suboxone with a big dose. We have not done this enough for me to say, here's how you do it or make recommendations on how you do it. All I can say is that we're moving fast, we're learning fast, and hopefully six months from now, I'll be able to say, here's how we do it. Um, so at this point, if you're in a scenario where you're wanting to do an outpatient induction and you're having trouble with it, uh, this is where our collaboration um, really can help out. You can talk to your local OTP, you can contact us and reach out, um, and we really need to be working together um, to, to solve this problem. So um, collaboration is absolutely key. So um, patients may have to initiate treatment uh, with methadone first, because you're not going to precipitate withdrawal with methadone. They may need to go to the OTP first and get methadone and then do a methadone to suboxone transition. That might be um, an avenue that's required. Um, outpatient treatment, you can certainly still do standard inductions. You can certainly try that. And, and it's just that they're not as reliable as they used. I mean, they used to be completely reliable. They're just not as reliable. So you can still do that, but you just have to recognize if your patient's having trouble getting on Suboxone, um, it's probably because of the fentanyl analogs, and reach out to your OTP or to um, uh, UNC or addiction specialist to get some guidance. Sometimes people are being hospitalized for initiating buprenorphine, which we're seeing a lot more with our pregnant patients. Um, and then, you know, we all have our ADACs as well. Don't, don't forget about them. And you may be able to you know, make good relationships with your ADACs as, as resources to help you. So as I said, we do have some example protocols. I'm not gonna go through them, but they're here for your reference. And anybody's welcome to reach out to me for more information. I've also included a protocol of what we put together for doing this in the outpatient setting. So if you look at it, you'll see it's not simple for someone to do in the outpatient setting. 
And then I want to come back quickly and just highlight um, the waiver. Uh, so this was uh, discussed earlier. If you want to prescribe Suboxone or buprenorphine, you do still need a waiver. So uh, that gets asked a lot. So the question is, yes, you do still need a waiver. You just don't need the education to get the waiver, which sounds a little strange, um, but you just go in to apply the waiver. You check a box saying you did not do your training and you can still have a waiver. You can have a waiver to treat 30 patients or less. If you ever want to treat more than 30 patients, you have to do the training. And then uh, we are coincidentally having a waiver training on Monday. Um, and uh, so anybody who has interest in that, please reach out and we'll sign you up for that waiver training. The waiver training is half and half, so it's four hours live and then four hours of online modules. What I would recommend is even if you don't wanna do the full eight hours of training, still do a half and half training to get some education. You don't have to do the whole eight hours. But as Dr. Baca Atlas mentioned earlier, education is still really important. So still do some education and anybody is welcome to participate in this for the first four hours just for that education component. So if you'd like to sign up for that, um, please reach out. So in summary, what we have talked about today, we have discussed um, collaboration uh, is uh, key, is super important. We talked about OTPs and OBOTs um, as levels of care for addiction treatment and how we can collaborate between um, these two levels of care to maximize outcomes for patients. We talked about microinduction and um, that it is successful for patients using fentanyl. More to come about macro inductions. Um, and then we discussed how just the fentanyl analogs are complicating everything. So that is all I have. So we're going to end there and I will go ahead and stop sharing so we can do questions. Yeah, thank you so much for both of, from both of you. It was great. Um, I think this question is for Dr. Burson. Glad to hear about the probation officer assistance through the referral to the OTP. Was the probation officer also involved and helpful with the subsequent drug test, allowing Tina's treatment to continue? Yes, this, there was a great deal of variation between probation officers. This particular probation officer um, was, we were able to convince him to hang in there with the patient. Um, and uh, so in the end, yes, yes, he was cooperative. It took a little education and the patient's cancer was really the main one to deal with that. It's good to hear. Um, the second question, is there any evidence that withdrawal periods are shortening due to fentanyl? For example, peak withdrawal reducing from 36 hours to 24? Uh, I don't think so. I think withdrawal is worse. Um, and it seems like um, it does take longer for people to get to peak withdrawal. Um, uh, but I think withdrawal from fentanyl analogs, it's not like anything we've seen before. Yeah, I also wanted to bring up a question that was asked earlier that we said we'd save till later. Could you please provide information on specifics of MOUD for adolescents, 16, 17 year olds, for example? Well, I can tell you that the studies we have show that they benefit just as much as the adults, but at the OTP, we cannot admit a patient unless younger than 18, unless we have parental consent and two unsuccessful inpatient treatment attempts separated by at least two weeks that are documented. So we're limited at the OTP. If, if a patient's younger than 18, in general, I would refer them to an outpatient um, Suboxone provider. And for buprenorphine, it's FDA approved to um, age 16 and um, uh, can be started. It is usually not. Um, is, is it's underutilized quite a lot for our adolescent population. Um, uh, I think there's this just general sentiment that we don't want to start our teenagers on this long-term medicine, but we also know outcomes are better when this medication is started. So um, I think we're still learning in our adolescent population. And um, would you recommend microdosing for people who are on a stable dose of methadone and want to switch to Suboxone? So go ahead, Dr. Burson. 
I, I think that there has been some talk about doing that. The, the, the more standard way that we've done in the past is to gradually taper that patient down to a dose of 30 or 40 milligrams, maybe skip uh, a day or two, and then transition them to um, buprenorphine. Um, but I, I think there are some protocols that are being developed to uh, avoid having to do that taper. Like if you have a patient at 110 milligrams, maybe you can do. Uh, I'm waiting to see more information. And so I'll say again, it's not evidence-based because we don't have the evidence yet, but we have done this um, a handful of times in the protocol I sent. Uh, there's a methadone transition and it has worked just exceedingly well, surprisingly well. Um, so again, not evidence-based, make sure that's clear, um, but we're at least doing it and it's working. Great, I think that was all the questions that we have so far, Amanda. Turn it back over to you. Great, thanks, Pam. Um, oh, and thanks. Wait, one more question, if we have time. Yes, we do. Um, yeah, do you worry that youth exposed to treatment and risk and settings to and restrict maybe restrict settings to access to care will have a traumatic impact, worsening their chance of wellness? And can most families afford that? I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah. Okay. Do you worry that youth exposed to to treatment and restricted in restrictive settings will have a traumatic? I guess will be traumatized by treatment in that restrictive setting, and that that may worsen their chance of wellness. I don't know what restrictive setting means. I don't, I don't either. I think what Dr. Burst and I and, and ever, all the panelists here, what we would advocate for is that people get um, medication for opioid use disorder as a part of, at least have it offered as a part of their addiction treatment. We certainly have facilities and residential programs and our jails and prisons and uh, programs that do not accept evidence-based medicine. And we strongly advocate that they do allow evidence-based medicine uh, because we know that it works. I don't know if that answers the question. Okay, so now back to Amanda. Thank you both. Appreciate you sharing how treatment is evolving and um, with the understanding that things may change in another few months, I, I'm really thankful that you all shared um, what you're doing currently. So that concludes today's meeting. Um, thank you again to all of our panelists and to each of you for joining us today and for your active participation, both in the chat and the Q&A. Um, and so as a reminder, the meeting agenda, the recording in the PowerPoint will be available on the OPDAC website within the next week. And you can see the link listed there where we house all of the previous OPDAC agendas and meeting recordings. Our next OPDAC meeting will be held in June. We are hopeful that we may be able to meet in person or at least in a hybrid format. So we're in the early phases of planning that and coordinating with the conference center in Raleigh based on their availability. So we don't have a date finalized quite yet, but it will likely be either a Thursday or Friday morning in June. And we'll certainly update you all once we have that date and once the, final, the topic is finalized. So wanted to thank you all once again and hope everyone has a great rest of the day.